your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 again. This is part 3, the last installment, and I'm going to tie it all together today, Lord willing. Now, beloved, and by the way, because I know we're on TV, the message is part 3, Terror of the Lord. The purpose for this series has not been to frighten you. That's not what I'm doing it for. Beloved, I, what I want to do is give you a good understanding of salvation, which a lot of people don't know. They just don't know. And so uh, I'm hoping that it will, will help us appreciate not only what God gave us, but take sober and seriously what we have so we can continue to pursue God. Amen? You see, folks, my job as your pastor is, is to watch out for your soul. Isn't that what the Scripture says? The pastor's job is to watch out for their soul. And uh, I, I want to help you get to heaven. That's, that's why we're here. Um, otherwise, I'd be retired. <laughs> okay? That's why we're here. We, we want to help you get to heaven. So let's open up our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 9 to 11. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. The reason we do that, the Bible says when Ezra stood before the people and read the Word of God, they built a platform like this, and they put him on that platform, and they put the scrolls before him, and he was elevated, and people were standing in reverence to the Word of God. Beloved, imagine this is the Word that comes right from the very mouth of God himself. Preserved seven times, purified in the fire, the Bible says. Washed in blood because many men have ventured their lives so we and I could have this Bible. And I don't have time right now to go into the history of the Bible, but you would really appreciate it if you knew it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse number 9. Paul says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present, that is in our bodies, or absent out of our bodies, that death, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to the he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. The terror of the Lord, part three. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this book. Father, help me preach with passion and compassion. Father, anoint the word. May it stick to our hearts like Velcro, Lord God, that we may love it and live it. Be with us, we pray. Anoint this preacher with Peter Clay. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, beloved, we've come a long way. You may be seated, by the way. I want you standing all through the sermon. You get weary-eyed. We've come a long way in our understanding and in our study of the terror of the Lord. And we saw that that word terror, the Greek word is phobos, had a twofold meaning. On the one hand, it means to have deep reverence, awe, and respect for God's divine person and his supernatural power. While on the other hand, it means to shake and quake with great fear, dread, and trembling at the threats of his punitive judgments on those who dare to defy him and disobey him. It's amazing to me today how many people shake their fist in the nostrils of a holy God. Isn't it? And one little virus, one little, you know just knock us right down and we're nothing. And here's this God of the universe, speaks everything to existence out of nothing. So it amazes me. But anyways, we also learned what salvation by grace through faith really meant. And it means, uh, what it means, I should say, and we have seen how man's faith must constantly and continuously appropriate and cooperate with God's grace so we can let him save and sanctify us. In other words, I, I use the illustration, God throws out the life preserver, he throws out the rope, uh, he brings the boat, you have to hold on and just keep what, holding on as he's doing what to you, as he's reeling you in. So we talked all about that, beloved. And we also saw this, that God neither saves us or sanctifies us against our free will, either before or after our salvation. We must constantly cooperate with him, amen? And also we saw how God's divine sovereignty works in conjunction with man's human responsibility. And we also learned that, a, that Christians can indeed fail of the grace of God. They can indeed frustrate the grace of God. And sadly, the Bible says a Christian can fall from the grace of God and ultimately so backslide, so apostatize from the faith that they can be lost again. Why? Because of their impenitent sin and unfaithfulness to God, beloved, and their refusal to now obey God's commandments. That's always been the litmus of faith, whether or not you will obey his commandments. God said in the Old Testament, Oh, that they had such a heart that they would obey my commandments. Uh, um, 
Revelation 22, 16, it says, Blessed are they that what? Do his commandments. John is quoting out of uh, Moses, out of the book of Deuteronomy. Do his commandments, that they may have a right under the tree of life. And so we kind of put those things together, and we saw that a lot of people don't want to obey God, nor do they want to endure or persevere in the faith. And that's what you have to do in anything in life. You have to persevere, amen? You folks have been married for a while, you know what I'm talking about. Now, many of the Corinthian Christians then and also now obliviously endangered their souls by doing these things. They kept disobeying God. They were unfaithful, yet they still thought they were saved and sanctified. Why? Because when you get into sin, remember, sin is a liar. Sin is a cheat. Sin is deceitful. And they had deceived themselves into thinking that because I accepted Jesus once, that I'm all set. But you just began the battle. You just entered the race when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Now you're saved? Uh Uh-huh. Now keep letting him save you. The race isn't done yet. The battle's not over, is it? Now he's won the war, but we have to fight the battle. Now last week we saw point number one, the determined resolve in verse number nine. I'm just going to briefly go over it because I want to get into the heart of this so I can finish this today. That neither Paul nor the apostles took their salvation for granted like this, nor did they presume on the grace of God like this, beloved, or thought that they were still saved or sanctified even if they lived in impenitent sin or they were unfaithful to God or they disobeyed His commandments. You see, beloved, to be called a Corinthian Christian would be called a blankety, 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 blank in the days. I won't say it. A Corinthian Christian, that's what they called them, a blankety, blankety, blank, blah, 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 blah. And it was the most vulgar thing you could be called because they had come to Christ, they had practiced cult prostitution right downtown, they were fornicating at the altar of their false gods, then they got saved, and guess what they did? After they walked with the Lord for a while, some false teachers came into the church and said, don't worry about it, you're under grace, go do whatever you want to do. And that's what's happened today, unfortunately. But not here, praise the Lord. Now, beloved, verse 9 reveals that they had... The apostles and Paul had a healthy terror of the Lord. That is, such a real fear of the Lord that their faith both live and labor to strive faithfully to uh, live holy, righteous, and godly lives that were well-pleasing to God. And we saw last week why. And it says they wanted to make sure that they were noticed, in verse 9, accepted by Him on the day of judgment and counted worthy to now enter into the eternal kingdom of God. Would to God, would to God, that every Christian had that kind of fear of the Lord like that, the terror of the Lord. But sadly, they don't. Many Christians today do not want to fight the good fight of faith. They don't want to sacrifice or suffer anything for the kingdom of God's sake. And beloved, I'll tell you, that's the hardest thing is to die to self, isn't it? It really is. You know, you can give money easy. I mean, I don't have a lot of money, but the money I have, I have a problem giving money away. But boy, die into yourself. Uh, it really costs. It's, it's tough, isn't it? But a lot of Christians don't want to do anything for Christ's sake, beloved. They don't want to mortify or crucify the flesh. They'd rather titillate the flesh. And that's because of the false gospel. Remember, Satan always sends false teachers in amongst the people. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, there were many false prophets in them, in them days, and they will be in the last days. He says that many shall follow their pernicious ways. And so we want to make sure that we keep our nose in the book and we see what God has to say to us. Amen? But we saw, beloved, also that they don't want to obey God's commandments, nor do they want to separate from this evil world system. Instead, what they want to do is infiltrate it and indulge in it. And also, beloved, we saw that uh, they don't like to think about the terror of the Lord. Why? Because it spoils their carnality and their flesh and their worldliness. I'm not going to, out of sight, out of mind. And a lot of people live their life like that. I can't. I can't rest until I get something done. If I start something, to the grace of God, I, I try to finish it. I'm not a guy that likes to quit. But they love their fun and their pleasures, beloved, and they take their salvation for granted. So, as I conclude point number one, sadly, Corinthian Christians like this have no clue whatsoever as to what God's salvation really requires of them. They've heard bits and pieces, truncated bits and pieces on the internet, or perhaps somebody's told them, but they've not really ran into a sin-hating, devil-stomping, pulpit-pounder, window-rattling, shingle-pulling, blood-bought, born-again, Judeo-Christian preacher that preaches to them. Come on now. (laughs) All right. 
So anyway, beloved, a, a lot of Christians, uh, I told you last week, they mistakenly and naively think that what they're going to do is accept Jesus and then just coast into the kingdom of God. They'll drift along. That's the Greek word that is used in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. They, they think they're just going to drift along. And, and uh, God says, no, uh-uh, it doesn't work that way, uh, beloved. You've got to learn how to swim uh, when you're a Christian. Amen? And so what they end up doing, they end up committing moral and spiritual suicide. And we don't ever want that to happen here or happen to us. And you folks watching by television, they call me and write me. You don't want it happening to you either. Amen? All right, so let's begin today. Why did Paul have such a terror of the Lord? We saw point number one, the determined resolve. I want to begin right here. Point number two, the day of reckoning. That is the day of judgment. Look what he says in verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Now, beloved, the apostles and Paul knew that there was going to be payday someday for all men. Amen? And that we are all mankind heading pell-mell into the great day of judgment of Almighty God when our lives will be weighed and the balances of what is written in his books. The Bible says when we stand before God, God's going to open his books. First will be the Bible, the first book. Then will be the book of life. Is your name in the heavenly register? Then will be the book of tears. Then there will be the book of works. A lot of books, the Bible says, that God is going to uh, um, open. And the Bible says we have a recording angel next to you get that? Okay, you make sure you hear me preaching this, okay? <laughs> okay. So God says we have a recording angel that writes everything down that we say. That's why, beloved, my knees knock, believe it or not, after all the years when I come to this pulpit, my heart, because I understand that I'm going to give an account before God as a pastor and as a preacher. Now, beloved, the apostles and Paul lived in light of the coming day of judgment. The question is, do we? Do you think all the time, are you poignantly aware? What have I ever taught you about confessing your sins? Keep your what? Keep your account short every day. You do something wrong, Lord, forgive me. Put it under the blood. Help me to turn from it. You keep your account short with the Lord, beloved. All of us have an inescapable and unavoidable appointment with the God of the universe when all of the works, and the Bible says, all of the secrets of men's heart shall be revealed. And folks, it's an appointment with an audience of one at that time. Do you hear me? Namely, with the living God himself who sees and knows everything everything about us. Now hear me, I don't want you to miss this. Then there'll be no family now that will be there for moral and spiritual support to help you. See, a lot of people today take comfort. They know they're not living for the Lord. They know they're not faithful to God, but they got people around saying, don't worry about it, everything's okay. But if you were my friend, I would say to them, you need to worry about it. I love you with all my heart. I hope everything I can, but you need to worry about it, my brother. Because if you're going to die, I want you to know you're going to die. How about you? I wouldn't be much of a friend if I didn't tell him the truth, would I? But a lot of Christians are afraid to open their mouth because we hate confrontation, and we all do. And we all love to be loved, and there's nothing wrong with that, beloved, except when it causes you to shut your mouth. Amen? Come on, you can say amen out there. I I know every morning, Sabbath morning, I try to raise the dead when I come to church. Uh, But you see, beloved, we're going to have an audience of one, namely with a living God who knows and sees everything about us. And there'll be no friends there. There'll be no folks there that are going to help you or give you moral support to encourage you. to Don't worry about it. Keep doing what you're doing, whatever. I still love you. Beloved, I used to tell my children, Daddy will love you until the cows come home. And Daddy will die for you. I'll do everything I can, but I can't live the life of Christ for you. I can't do it. I can't do it. And I won't go to hell for you. As much as I love you, I will not go to hell for you. I love God too much. How about you? And I've had enough accountants to know the power of this God, beloved, when I was paralyzed uh, in, his, in his presence. Anyways, you and I are going to stand before God, and then I told you it will be an audience of one. And beloved, we will all assemble, all of humanity will assemble, but will be judged alone, then to see, receive our eternal allotment. Then the searching judgment of God will examine our words and our works, and it will determine whether or not we're really a friend or a foe of God. It will determine if we're really a pretender or a real, genuine child of God. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, it also determines whether or not you're a sinner or a saint, a hagios, one who's been separated, one who's been sanctified uh, before the living God. And he will reward us accordingly. 
God will then, in that day, the Bible teaches he's going to settle his accounts with all humanity who has ever lived. Now, I've taught you before, the trump card in life is death with God. Right? You can, just, you can cheat me. You can do all kinds of things to me, and I can do it to you. But the fact of the matter is we can't do it with God because he has the final say. A guy could kill someone today, not fess up, get away with it, not be arrested by the authority. And the moment he dies, he's before the Lord. And the Bible says in the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill or commit premeditated murder. That's why abortion is murder. Infanticide is murder. In Romans 2.5, the Bible says this of the second advent in the day of judgment. Now, I'm trying to do this slow for you because I want you to get it, okay? It says it will be a day of wrath and of the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. I've been teaching you in Sabbath school the difference between tribulation, philipsis, or wrath, or gay, God's wrath, or thumos, his merciful wrath. But you see, beloved, God is... Remember, he's, he's going to defend the sanctity of the cross. He's going to defend his son. Everything his done, son did for humanity so we can get us all into the kingdom. Amen? If people have shaken their fists in the nostrils of God, they've spurned him, they've cursed him, they've done all those things. So the Bible says, Paul warns the Romans, and these people have come to the Lord. He says the day of uh, Jesus Christ, the second advent, will be a day of wrath. And that word wrath there is the Greek word um, orge, and it means the unmerciful, the undiluted wrath of God. There'll be no mercy in it anymore. Right now, men may feel the wrath of God, but there's, that's Thumos wrath. There's mercy in it. God doesn't give them everything that they deserve. Why? The goodness of God, Romans 2, 4, is to lead us where? Under repentance. God is good. He's a good God. God loves to be loved. But he will not jeopardize his justice and his holiness for that. But anyways, it'll be a day of judgment for those who disbelieved and defied and disobeyed him. And conversely, beloved, and praise the Lord, it will be a day of unspeakable joy and blessings and rewards for all genuine believers who really loved and obeyed him, who faithfully followed and served him, beloved, and also suffered and sacrificed for him. If you have been a Christian for any amount of time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Amen? I can remember one time we were soul winning up in, up in Cabra. And this person lived in the woods. Of course, little did we know it was an opium den, really. And there was a house there, and it was pouring out. I forgot who I was with. Was I with you, Dave? Anyways, the, the, it was a dirt road, and it was just unbelievably soaked or whatever. And I looked at the house, and I, well, I don't know who was driving. I think it was. You had the Christmas light on you. <laughs> so anyways, I said, I'll go check it out, Dave. So the, the, the curtain's hanging down. And I got out of the car, walked in front of the car, and whoosh, I was right there here in water. And it's pouring. I said, only for you, Lord. Only for you. And I get out, squish, 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 and muddy and dirty and wet. I go up to the door. I opened it up. Oh, man, all smoking pot in there, right? I said, Lord, only for you. <laughs> this is great. You ever hear about Jesus? <laughs> I never smoked, I never took illegal drugs in my life. That's an honest truth. Never, ever, ever. If I never would, never want to. But anyways, beloved, what I'm showing you is this here, is that God says that we have to suffer for him. If we suffer with him, what did we read this morning in Sabbath school? We will also what? Reign with him. So, Jesus, did Jesus suffer for us? Yes. Did Jesus sacrifice for us? Yes. What is he supposed to do? What are we supposed to do now? He is our sovereign and supreme example. We're to suffer and sacrifice for who? Him. Okay, we're to follow him, follow in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, under point uh, number two, I've got four quick sub-points I want to give you. You ready? Okay, if you're right, taking notes. First thing I want you to see is the potentate who's judge. The potentate who's judge. Look at verse 10a. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I want you to notice that the divine judge that we all have to stand before on the day of judgment is no one less than the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the God-man. Now, the word Christ is the Greek word Christos, and it means the anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah. That's Aramaic, Mashiach. He's the Messiah, the eternal son of the living God. And Scripture teaches that he's the divine judge and magistrate that sits on the very throne of the universe that we all have to appear to <clears throat> before God on that day, beloved. 
in John 5, 22, mark this down. I want you to hear this. The Bible says this, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Dr. Luke said this in Acts 10, 42. He says, Christ was ordained by God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. The word quick means the living, the living and the dead. The Apostle Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 14, verse 10, he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And he also said in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, that on the day of judgment, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. You got some secrets? That's why David said, Lord, forgive me of my secret sins. Show them to me so I can fess up and put them under the blood. Amen. So these things you're doing in your closet, now's the time, of course, to get them right. So why was God, or why has God, chosen the Lord Jesus Christ to be the judge on that day? Now that's a good question, isn't it? I want you to look at verse 19 of this same chapter. Paul says, to wit, now watch this truth. This is high Christology here, the doctrine of Christ. That God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the apostles the word of reconciliation, secondarily to us Christians. Amen? The reason is because God the Father is an eternal spirit. However, he chose to incarnate himself in the person and the man whom we call the Lord Jesus Christ so he could redeem fallen humanity. Beloved, in theology we say this, that Jesus was the theanthropos. What does that mean? Jesus was the God dash man. He was the what? Begins with a T. The theanthropos. Anthropos is the Greek word we get our word what? Anthropology, the study of man. Theo, theos, or theos, is the Greek word for God. So he was the God what? All right, if I talk about the God man, I'm saying that word is, begins with a T. What is it? What was that? Okay. <laughs> I was getting ready to hang up my cleats if you didn't say it. So, so, so beloved, we're talking here, he's the God-man. He's both fully God and he's fully man. You say, Pastor Joel, I don't quite understand that. Join the club, neither do I. There's not a theologian on the top side of this earth that really understands that mystery of the incarnation. But, beloved, that's the mystery of the hypostatic union of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had two separate and distinct natures, a human nature and a divine nature. And orthodoxy teaches you must never confuse the two. A lot of heresies, when you I don't have time for this, a lot of heresies in the second century try to put the natures of Christ together. That he had one nature. Orthodoxy teaches he had how many natures? Two. He had a human nature and he had one else. A divine nature, okay? That's Christian orthodoxy that he has, you understand, he has two natures. Now, beloved, this made him both God's perfect man and man's perfect God. That's why he's called the Son of God and the Son of Man. Amen? See, it, it was a great mystery that God did. Now, as the Son of God, he could fully represent and identify with God and be worshipped as God and also forgive sins just like God when he was on this earth. But as the Son of Man, beloved, he could also enter into our human experience. He could fully identify with the plight and with the uh, fight and with the temptations of man in the moral and spiritual battle. In other words, if I'm going to have somebody judge me, I want them to walk in my shoes. How about you? You know, you and I could go before God legitimately and we could say, sure, you want me to live holy down here. You want me to separate from the world, but you don't have a clue what it's like down there. People are always nipping at you, persecuting you. Life is tough. You're trying to survive. You don't have a clue what it's like. And Jesus will stand up and says, I do. Right? I want you to settle that, beloved, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in your mind. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, that Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet he was without sin. Jesus was born fallen body, he didn't have a body perfect like Adam, but he was born with a perfect nature. He did not have a sin nature. And that's why I've taught you, you don't teach your children to do evil. They already know how to do evil. You're trying to teach them how to do good. Why? Because our nature from birth seminally has been passed on, of course, uh, from Adam on down. And in Hebrews 7.26, it says this about Jesus, that he was holy, harmless, 
undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Would you say hallelujah out there? Praise the Lord for our great high priest. Oh, beloved, what a divine mystery. The incarnation of God in Christ was and is. When Paul thought about this, he said this in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Listen to what he says. God was manifest in the flesh. Who was? God was. Justified in the spirit. Seen of angels. He says, preached unto the Gentiles, the heathen, the pagans, believed on in the world and received up in the glory. A perfect, sinless life. Would you say amen? Great he says, is the mystery of godliness. Indeed, beloved, we know that Jesus was the sinless Son of God, but as the Son of Man, He also knew the first pull and passion and power of sin and temptation. He was tempted like we are. Can you imagine a man, 33 and a half years old, beloved, in the prime of his life, strong, virile, uh, uh, even though he was on a real blue-eyed, handsome guy, he was dark-skinned like myself, but I'm sure he must have looked at the women that he created. So, you know, they're pretty. If I'm anything better than a woman, I kept it for myself. <laughs> but I'm sure he must have. Uh, how about you? The Bible says, in all points as we are, he was tempted. Yet, of course, he was without sin. See, beloved, I'm saying this, that he experienced the same satanic attacks like we do, the same seductive, sinful allurements of this evil world system, just like we do. He himself, beloved, was in that great moral and spiritual battle. You know, with Satan all of his life, on the Mount of Temptation, the Bible says Satan did everything he could to corrupt Jesus. But then the Bible says in the, in the, in the book of Luke, Luke writes down, he says, and Satan left him, dot, 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 for a season. In other words, he tried his best shot right there, but now he's going to try to catch Christ off guard when he was weak, when he was tired, when he was bearing our infirmities, <coughs> sick. Okay, beloved, the Bible says he would do that as he identified with mankind. I'm saying he knew what it was to be tempted like us. He knew what it was to be hungry and thirsty like us, the Bible says. Tired, he slept, uh, the Bible says. He knew what it was like to be mocked and rejected and betrayed just like us. But he also knew what it was like to be crucified for us. Would you say amen? Oh, listen to me. Jesus felt physical pain and suffering just like us. Jesus felt mental pain and suffering just like us. Emotional. You know, I can take physical pain. You can too. You get used to it. You, you, you live with it. But boy, when it's in the heart, doesn't that hurt? It just cuts you right to the quick. And you wish you could just rip it out and say, all right, put a nail in my arm or something, whatever it is. Let me get it over with. Let me heal. But that really hurts. But Jesus felt that, beloved. In other words, I'm saying he knew the agony and the anguish of soul and spirit just like we do. But listen to me, beloved. Our Lord knew the depth of fear and dread much more than we'll ever know. Our Lord knew the depth of foreboding and distress much more than we'll ever know. Our Lord knew the depth of horror and terror much more than we'll ever know. And listen to me. Our Lord knew the depth of God's undiluted wrath and hell when he was on that cross like we'll never know. Amen? The Bible says he dipped his soul in the hell on the cross and suffered the torments of the damned on the cross. And I don't understand it because he suffered for an eternity on that cross, but the time span was three hours. But he was an eternal person with an eternal consequence that he had to pay and purchase an eternal pardon for us. So I don't quite understand it, but I know it's true. So who, pray tell you, uh, pray tell, I ask you, is better qualified to be the judge of sinful fallen man than him who identified with man in every area and aspect of life so he could redeem us and now also accurately and perfectly examine and judge, judge us. Listen to me, beloved. Listen to me now. It was the Son of God who walked this earth, not God the Father. You got that? Not only that, beloved, but you hear me now. Did you ever really think about this? Right now, the Lord Jesus Christ, though he's going to be our judge, is also our advocate with the Father. He's also our mediator with Father. He's also our intercessor with the Father. He's our great high priest with the Father, beloved. Don't you miss this, beloved. Don't miss it. Listen now. 
He also hears and hears our prayers. He also presents all of our petitions to God. He also defends and pleads our case before God, the throne of Almighty God. And he also sees the struggles and the pilgrimage and the spiritual battle that we're in on earth. And he knows your strengths and he knows your weaknesses. And he naturally empowers and helps us by his spirit and grace to do everything he can so we, like him, can overcome self, Satan, and this evil world system. Wouldn't you say amen out there? Yes, he's my judge, but he's also my advocate. Yes, he's my judge, but he's also my mediator. Yes, he's my judge, but he's also my high priest. Come on and say amen. You think he can understand what we're saying? You think he can understand us as a judge? I think he can. I keep rolling up my sleeve. My wife bought me this suit. It it fits finally up here. It doesn't fit too good here, but the sleeves, I have to grow a little one. (laughs) I was going to pin them this month. But don't you do that, Joe. I used to staple them in my pockets when I, when I lived alone. I had a hole in my pocket and they are all done. You see, beloved, so I'm asking you this. Who is more competent? Who's more capable? Who is more qualified to also be the judge of our life and eternal destiny than the divine lawyer, the barrister himself who has been seated in the heavens representing us and pleading our case and encouraging us to go on to victory with him? Would you say Amen. Oh, the Bible says, Paul says, if God be for us, who can uh, can be against us? Amen? If God be for us, who can be against us? So what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying simply this. There's victory in Jesus. You see, beloved, he represents us, not the, the Father, not the Holy Spirit, not the angels, but the Lord Jesus Christ who became one of us. And he knows us through and through. He is also our judge, beloved. Therefore, we can be sure that our judgments will be fair and equitable. We can be sure that the judgment we face before Jesus will be impartial and just and perfect and righteous and good, beloved. Why? Because I told you he's seen our struggles. He's heard our prayers. And he was a man once himself. Tempted at all points as we are. A better person to understand you. You know, as a, as a pastor, a lot of people come up to me and they say, Pastor, you're always afraid to come to you. I said, if there's anybody you should never be afraid to come to, it's me. If anybody will support you on this, I don't care if you, I don't want to say a bunch of jail boards and raise your hand, but you folks who have gone to jail, has Pastor Joel been there? Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> I probably should have been thrown in there, but, but I, I've tried to, beloved, listen to me. If you need the doctor, go to the doctor where you get healed. If anybody can help you, it can be someone who, who's been ordained by God, who knows the Word of God, and he's trying to pastor for God, and he wants to help you. He, I won't judge you, beloved. That's not me. You know that. I, I, I'm not like that. So the first thing we saw was the potentate who's the judge. Number two, the second thing I want you to see is the place of judgment. Look what he says in verse 10a. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat. The judgment seat of Christ, kaya bema Christos is that Greek phrase, beloved. But I want you to notice that this judgment seat belongs to Jesus Christ himself. He'll be the divine judge who'll sit on the throne of the universe on the day of judgment. And this is synonymous with the great white throne judgment that we find in Revelation chapter 20, for Scripture teaches that there's only one general day of judgment for all men on the last time, uh, last day at the end of time, and not two, as some wrongly suppose or assume. Now let me just give you an addenda here. A lot of Christians are teaching today that what happens is there's a pre-tribulation rapture seven years before Jesus comes at the second advent. So they say the Christians are taken off this earth, the tribulation. Remember I taught you that in Sabbath school today? Okay, but we're not. But they're teaching that. So you go to heaven, and then we get judged, and then he comes back seven years later, the second advent. He establishes a thousand-year kingdom, and at the end of that thousand-year kingdom, then there's the great white to throw judgment. That's bogus. The church never believed that, beloved, for almost 2,000 years until the rise of dispensationalism came into the program in the middle of the 19th century. So, there's one general day of judgment at the end of time. Jesus said six times in the book of John chapter 6, I will resurrect you on the what? The last day. I will resurrect you on what? The last day. I will resurrect you on the last day. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Would you say amen? So uh, we know that that's bogus, beloved. Now, the phrase Bema seat, or Bema seat, a lot of people call it, is a graphic and a familiar term Paul used to describe 
uh, uh, judgment seats that were used throughout history with both Israel's and pagan kings. For example, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself stood before Pilate's Bema seat. And the Apostle Paul, he appealed to Caesar, remember, because he was a Roman citizen. He, sto he stood before uh, Caesar's Bema seat. Now, the Bema seat was a raised, ornate platform in a large courtroom-like hall with marble floors. And it had these great, long, scarlet drapes that would hang down, almost like we have here. You've probably seen the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. And as he stood before Pharaoh, right, you see that court. And you've probably seen other shows where uh, uh, somebody in the kingdom is standing before the king and there's this huge judgment hall and it's on an elevated platform. And in the middle of that platform is set the bema, the bema seat. And so that's what Paul's been talking about here, beloved. And on that bema seat, there were other important government officials and dignitaries that would sit on that first deck and there's that Bema seat up here, and they will be looking up all the time at the official king or the ruler who was judging the people. Now remember, the king's job, the ruler's job here, beloved, was to judge those who, uh, who were accused of committing a crime or breaking the law in the kingdom. They were either acquitted or they were condemned. That was his job. Paul is quite, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He's quite, uh, somebody help me, he's quite aware, that's what I want. He's quite aware that everybody in his audience to whom the book was written are aware of a Bema seat because they had to stand before Caesar anyways. And so they understood what he was talking about. Now, beloved, why does Paul use this? He does it for this reason, beloved, because the great white throne of Jesus, our Lord's throne on which he sits, as the King of Kings... And the Lord of Lords is exalted infinitely higher and more lifted up than any of the other thrones that have ever been set up on this earth or up in the heavens. Because the Bible says that Satan has principalities and powers, and they're in the heavens, the heavenlies. He has his satanic uh, captains, he has his satanic lieutenants, he has his satanic uh, sergeants, and his demons, his satanic privates. And so there are many principalities and powers, and that's why Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, the god of this evil world system. Amen? But, beloved, the, the great white throne of Jesus, I want you to think about this. The great white throne is attended by multitudes and myriads of celestial angels. And around the throne, the Bible tells us, in a semicircle is set the 24 elders. Just like the famous seat of the of Israel, they had the elders around them, the king was on the throne, just like the pagans had the elders around them, the king was on the throne. And so Paul is using this analogy so we can identify with it, amen? So here's Christ, sit it high, lift it up, king of kings, lord of lords, 24 elders in a semicircle around him, and now he's passing judgment also. Now, beloved, listen to me. The Bible teaches that in that day, this throne of Christ is so regal, so majestic, so glorious, that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, it says that the old heavens and the earth will flee away, or they fled away when Christ sat on the throne. Now, the Greek word fled away, phaiugo, means that they vanished, they disappeared, and now became totally extinct. So the place of judgment is the great white throne judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is also known as his what? Be my seat. Amen. You got that? All right. So that's my second point. Second point. Sub point. The place of judgment. Now, beloved, I want you to see the periphery of judgment. Look what he says in verse 10a. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The word all appear, past veneruo, uh, means, beloved, because I, I want you to notice the universal scope of the day of ju judgment. Paul's saying it is all inclusive, it is comprehensive. It is universal. That is, the day of judgment before Christ's white throne is for all people, individually and collectively, everywhere who have ever lived. This includes every male and female. This includes every child, every teenager, every adult. This includes every sinner. This includes every saint, beloved. We all have a divine appointment to stand before the great tribunal, that bar, that bema seat, of the Lord Jesus Christ to be judged of both our words and our works before God. 
Now, I want you to picture this. Here's the beam of seat, okay? It's a little more glorious than this, but I want you to see this. Is Jesus sitting on the beam of seat, right? Behind him is the glory of who? The glory of God. God the Father is right behind him. You know what I think you should do, Jesus? What's that then? Okay. And Jesus makes his determination. Amen? I want you to picture that in your mind, how that judgment seat is going to work. And everybody who has ever lived at any time from the first, uh, from Adam, all the way down to the end of this age when Jesus comes again, everybody's going to stand before him. Not for the things we did after we did, but we're dead, but for all the things we did when we were alive. Now, in Hebrews 9.27 says this, For it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Now, that word judgment is the Greek word krisis. Sometimes it's translated krono. But let me tell you what it means, beloved. It means the crisis. Once to die, the crisis. And that crisis here has a twofold meaning. First, it refers to the immediate crisis that happened of what happens to the eternal destiny of our soul when we pass out of our body at the moment of death. God sends his angels, beloved, if you're saved, and uh, they, they uh, escort us into the heaven and hell to await the final day of judgment. In other words, if I'm a saved Christian, I slip out of my body that moment, the angels take me where? They take my soul to heaven. If I'm unsaved, that first judgment, he says, no, no, you're not going up, you're going down. It's appointed unto all men once to die, but after what? After this, the crisis. The first immediate crisis that all men are going to face. Secondly, beloved, it refers to the ultimate crisis. What do you mean, preacher? The ultimate crisis on the day of judgment. We stand before the great white throne of Christ. God then resurrects our bodies and reunites it with our soul and judges us for everything we ever did in our bodies what we did with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now those that are His or saved will then receive their eternal rewards in a glorified body that's suited to forever live in the eternal kingdom of God with Him. Isn't that wonderful? We're going to be glorified. We're going to have a body fashioned like unto Christ's glorious body. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, for the Lord knoweth them that are His. Let everyone that nameth, having the seal, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God knows, I've always taught you, there's a visible church and there's a what? Invisible. Many people sit in churches today. That's the visible church. But God looks down and says, that one's not regenerated, that one's not, and that one's living in sin. See, God sees the true church, doesn't he? And that's why I always tell you to keep your account short. God sees the true church, and that's a biblical. You're probably getting more theology here than most seminaries are giving out today. I hate to say it, but that's just a fact. But what am I saying to you, beloved? Conversely, all the unsaved and the impenitent will also receive their punishment and condemnation, and they'll receive a resurrected body. But this resurrected body will now be uh, uh, formed and fashioned to be able to endure the environs of an eternity in the lake of fire. In other words, there's no such doctrine as annihilation or psychopanicia, uh, dark night of the soul. That's all heresy that's trying to creep into the church because people say, well, you don't have to worry about being uh, saved or you're going to be burned up in the end anyways. You know, you're gonna, it's going to be warm food. That, that's not true. I wish it was. Oh, I wish it was. I have a lot of unsaved friends and relatives that are goose-stepping right now in the lake of fire or hell, beloved. So I don't enjoy having to say that. But God says when they go there, they will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth forever and ever. The worst part about hell is not just the punishment. It is not just the flames, beloved. The torment of the mind. The worm dies not to conscience. I, how many times did I hear somebody preach about that? And I, you know, I, the worst part about hell is be the first time that a man has ever lived eternally separated from God. Right now, every person in the universe, every person, has access to the love of God and the person of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God, but not in that day. 
There'd be no second chances now, amen. There's no purgatory. That's a doctrine coming out of the pit of hell, out of Babylonian paganism. It was adopted by the Roman Catholic Church. I don't say that I condemn Roman Catholics. I was one, beloved. And I thank God for everyone that's walking in all the light that they can. But that's just a false doctrine. But it gave people, they made a lot of money with that doctrine. I don't have time to go there because I'm playing beat the clock. I've got, I've got, what, 37 minutes left? Yeah, okay. Anyways, beloved. So what have I taught you? I taught you that there is a first and a second crisis of judgment we must all face. I taught you there's also an immediate and an ultimate judgment, uh, crisis of judgment that we must all face. Now, beloved believers who have placed and kept their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says we are complete in Him. When we get saved, we get baptized, we, bap we pass from death unto life, and the Bible says you have been accepted not because you're so holy, You've been accepted in the Beloved because He was holy for you. Amen? Oh, Beloved, that just rejoices my soul. When I look at myself, I say, there's no way I can get to heaven. When I look at Jesus, I say, I can't help but get into the heaven. How about you? So what am I saying to you, Beloved? I'm saying this, that in the day of judgment, we're going to hear God say those blessed words to all of His saved people. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Won't that be wonderful? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Conversely, beloved, there's going to be many that are going to hear those dreadful words, especially the unsaved, the impenitent backslider, apostates. Jesus said he's going to say to them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Can you imagine, beloved? Christ is omniscient. He knows everybody. But I, it's like I was looking at Benny. I said, Benny, you know, you keep doing that. I'm going to say I don't even know you. That's what God's saying, right? Don't, don't come to me. I, I won't even, I won't be associated with you. How are you ruining my reputation? You're a real rascal, Benny, you know that? I got to beat the fire out of you. Well, I got a chance before I get too old. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through uh, 23. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Kurios, Kurios, Lord, Lord, the Bible says, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Hear that? That doeth. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? And I will confess unto them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. People are saying they're healing in Jesus' name today, and they're not. And I believe in divine healing. We've seen it. I've had it myself. I, 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 beloved, I took a, one day, uh, I don't know if I should tell you this, <clears throat> I was whittling. And I was trying to pass some time, right? And I had a, and one thing you never do with a chisel that's brand new is you never put it towards you, just like a knife, you know. But I had this one little area. I forgot what I was, uh, what was I whittling? The Mona Lisa, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, and I said, I got a piece of it, <clears throat> and it went right through my hand. It, the, 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 I, I owned my health food store at that time. It was just before I got in the ministry. And that thing sticking in my hand like this, and I looked at it, and a woman walked in the door of the store. And she went, oh, oh. I said, I'm okay, I'm okay. So I took my hanky out, and I pulled it out. I probably shouldn't, because I, 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 I wasn't bleeding much, so I figured I didn't nick an artery or anything like that. So I took it out, wrapped my hand. She took me to the, to the uh, emergency room, and I kind of waited in the line. And, and then the doctor came up to me. He says, what did you do? I says, I put this through my hand. He said, well, let me look at it. And he looked at it. He says, now, I want to put some stitches here and some stitches there. I said, I don't need any stitches. He said, what do you want? I said, tape it. <laughs> clamp it. So he put a clamp on it. So I went home, and I prayed on it. I prayed on it for probably three hours. I mean, it was throbbing. Next morning, I woke up. You know there was a scab on it. it, was, it within two or three days, it was gone. Why? God touched it. Now, that doesn't always happen, okay, because God doesn't always heal. But he does heal. And he uses doctors to heal, and he uses medicines to heal. He heals ordinarily and extraordinarily sometimes. Amen? That's the way God works. So uh, the point I'm getting, these people are saying, Lord, I healed in your name. I went out preaching in your name. God said, you wouldn't obey me. You did it your way. You're like Frank Sinatra, and you're going, he is. You see, beloved, that's why Paul spoke about the terror of the Lord here. Why? 
because he was always mindful of the fact of the coming day of judgment that would determine the eternal destinies of all men in either heaven or hell who accepted him or rejected him or neglected him. Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape if we what? Neglect so great salvation. I told you last week, if you neglect your God, and it's going to be grown over with weeds. Amen? So, beloved, not only was it the love of Christ that constrained Paul to preach the gospel with such urgency and to persuade men to repent and accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior and then live holy, righteous, and obedient lives to God, but it was also the terror of the Lord that moved him to do it. It was the terror of the Lord that motivated him, that stirred him, that drove him to do it. Why? Because he says, I want to be accepted of God in that day. I, God has given me these gifts. I want to use them for his glory. I want my life to count before the Lord. I want to serve Him until the day I die. That's what Paul was saying. I want to be acceptable and well-pleasing to my Lord. That's what he says in verse number 9 there. So, beloved, does the fear of the Lord drive you to also do this? Does that fear of the Lord really drive you to get your life right and stay right with God? I hope it does. How about being faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I just ran out, but I, I think I can wrap this up in five minutes. You want to... You, Otherwise, you know, this, this is the rest of the sermon. <laughs> All right. My fourth sub-point, the purpose of judgment. Look what he says in verse 10b. He says, according to that he had done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Oh, no, wait, wait a minute. Where was I? That everyone may receive, the middle section there, B, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. Let me stop you there. The purpose of judgment, that Greek word receive, komizo, means to properly obtain, to accept, to take delivery of your just due on the day of judgment. Now, I told you on the day of judgment, God will judge our salvation, our lives, our, our secrets, our obedience, our faithfulness, our service. And beloved, he's going to reward his people. Now, a lot of Christians are going to be saved, the Bible says, so as by fire on that day. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. You know that text. Because their works will be wood, hay, and stubble. In other words, they weren't living in sin, but they weren't doing much for God. And when they did something for God, there was always that ulterior motive that I'm looking to get something here. If I can just get on Ben's good side or Derek's good side, I need something. You see, there's a quid pro quo here, right? And God says, the fiery eyes of Christ's judgment of that day, he says, he'll look at us, and your works will either be wood, uh, hay or stubble, burn up immediately, poof! Or there'll be gold, silver, and precious stone. They'll be able to withstand the intense scrutiny of the eye, fiery eyes of the Son of God. But notice he says also, beloved, receive the things done, he says, dear, in the body. Soma. And it means all things you said and did in your physical body while you were here on earth. In other words, our temporal life, what we do now, here, has eternal consequences. Think about it, beloved. Men are being judged and condemned today because of their sins and what they've done in their body, right? You did, and I did too. Then I got saved, and God forgave me those sins, right? But it was because of my what? My sins done where? In my body. My body becomes the vehicle that I do these things. Likewise, when I get saved, my body becomes the vehicle, the vessel, the very instrument of God to now let him live his life in us, with us, through us, uh, beloved, and we can minister to him. Amen? So our body has a lot to do with it, and that's why we try to take care of our bodies. It's a temple of the indwelling Holy Spirit. But notice also our judgment will be according, it says. That Greek word pros means in regard and respect to either all of the good, agathos, that is all of the moral and just things we did, the decent, the upright things that we did that are approved by God. God says they're correct, they're acceptable, and they are now worthy of my commendation and my reward to you. I want a reward. And it's amazing to me, beloved. God saves us by his grace. Then he gives me the grace to be able to preach or teach or write or well, all these things. And then God says, even though that all belongs to me, Joel, I'm going to reward you for it. All right? He's going to give me rewards for his grace. And Paul said, he, Paul said he worked harder than any other apostle. He says, but not me. The grace of God in me. It wasn't me that was doing it. It was the grace of God that was pumping and stirring me. And so I just kept doing it. And that's why he says, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my fulfillment, the death is at hand. 
I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. He said, go ahead, lop off my head. You can just see the executioner's axe come down. Plop. And Paul's head and immediately into the presence of God. Amen. So what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying this. God wants to reward us for our good works, but also notice he's going to reward us for our bad. Kekos is that Greek word, and it means the wrong, the evil, the immoral, the wicked things we did in God's sight that will be utterly disapproved and unacceptable to him and now altogether worthy of his condemnation and punitive judgment. Paul said to the church at Galatia, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Hey, let me ask you something. Are you sowing to the flesh or spirit? I hope you get You know what, Pastor? I'm sowing to the f- Spirit. <laughs> right? Pastor, I'm sowing to the Spirit. Boy, I want to please Jesus. Boy, I love Jesus. Boy, I want to serve Jesus. Boy, I want to be faithful to Jesus. I hope you can say that. I wake up every morning from my lips to God's ears. Good morning, Heavenly Father. I love you. Good morning, Lord Jesus. I love you. Good morning, Holy Spirit. I love you. Then I quote Isaiah 50 and verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned. This was the Messiah. Was, it was a messianic prophecy. He's given me the tongue of the learned. And I don't know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth me morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. Oh, Lord. Oh, I'm just a student of the word. I want to hear, Lord. I want you to teach me. Speak to me. Speak in me. Speak through me. That's what I pray to God every day. How about you? So, beloved, on the day of judges, some believers are going to be saved, I told you, so as by fire. And lastly, point number three, and I'll close with this very quick. Verse 11, the discerning realization, the discerning realization, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Now, note that word knowing there. That's the Greek word ido, and it means perceiving the terror of the Lord. It means understanding, being aware of the terror of the Lord, paying attention to the terror of the Lord. Hey, beloved, wait a minute, wait a minute now. Hear me. Are you aware of the terror of the Lord? Are you paying attention to it? I hope so. How about the day of judgment? Is that in your mind? You know, the more you walk as a Christian, the more you start walking circumspect, don't you? And especially the older you get. And you say, you know something? And God tells us, that's why. See, our next door neighbor, I don't worry about my next door neighbor. And sometimes we can get jealous of them. And David in the imprecatory Psalms, he was. He says, look it, these guys are unsaved, Lord. Their kids are nice and healthy and strong. They get all kinds of money. Their, their cattle doesn't throw their firstborn when it's born. Look at me, I'm going through the fire. He said, I didn't understand it all until I went into the house of God. When he went to the house of God, the preacher got a hold of him and started preaching. He says, that's the only heaven they'll know right now. Right? You see, the unsaved have one nature. A fallen nature. You and I have what? Not only a fallen nature, but we've got the new man, the new nature. And the new nature is to crucify and mortify that old nature. Amen? We've got two natures now. My neighbor doesn't have us. He doesn't care what he does. He's, he's oblivious to the things, but I'm not. And I, I, my next door neighbor, I love him. He's a big guy. Bro. I told you, he's six foot eight. And I, every, he comes over to me. He, he won't leave me alone. Hey, preacher, preacher. What do you want? He said, you know, somebody, I, I got a friend of mine, I, I, I won't tell you the story because I'm on TV, only the upshot of it. I was supposed to get this job and work at this job, and what happened was one of the, when they were pulling down a pillar of a building on a, it was tied, this cable was tied onto a backhoe, the thing snapped and it cut his head off. He said, I went to the wake and I didn't understand it. I said, what do you mean? He said, I got to ask you this. They didn't have a body there, and they said they didn't cremate him. What did they do with the body? I said, cryogenics. I said, they froze it. A lot of people having their head cut off frozen, hoping that science somewhere along the line will find how to keep the body alive, but the curses on man, they'll never happen. Okay, the curses on mankind from Almighty God. And what they're hoping is some 30 years in the future, whatever, they'll be able to take that dead frozen body and put a new heart into it and put the cables on them. <laughs> you know, he probably got his head on backwards, right? 
But there's two things I want you to see here very quickly, very quickly. Number one, I want you to see Paul's pressing motivation. Notice what he says. He says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, he says, we persuade, we pytho man. What does that mean? It's a present tense verb. It means he constantly and continuously tries to exhort and encourage and convict folk through the gospel and knowing the terror of the Lord. When I share the gospel with someone, I don't go up to them and say this. I don't go up and say, Brother Dave, listen to me. You want to go to heaven? You want to go to heaven, don't you? Of course, you want a better life. You want God to bless you? Listen, if you accept Jesus, he can do it. That's a false gospel. My brother Dave, listen to me. You know I love you, but I've got to tell you the truth. You're a sinner just like I am. We're under the curse and condemnation of God's law. If you don't repent of your sins and accept Christ as your Savior, you're going to die and go straight to hell. No, I don't want you to do that. I love you too much for that, day. You see what I'm saying? The other way is a false gospel. It's a man-centered gospel. This way is the biblical gospel. Men need to know why they're dying. Condemned them. Why? Because they've broken his law. And God can't change it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sent his son down to die uh, for that. So, beloved, Paul says he does everything he can to turn people to God, to get them right with God, to walk with God and live for God. Paul's saying, I'm doing everything I can. I'm persuading men. I'm trying to convince them the best of my ability. Beloved, you listen to me. You know it. You folks who have tried to preach, you know how much it takes out of you. Am I right? I will go home today. My wife's right here. I will have seven glasses of water that'll be that big. They'll be that big. Probably for <laughs> They'll be, you know, it's like going fishing. So how big was your fish? He goes, well, the pitcher weighed 15 pounds, right? <laughs> but because you lose so much fluid as you speak and as you talk and as you counsel and as you preach and as you sweat like I do, you're trying to persuade men. You're trying to convince men because you know there's one heartbeat, one breath away from meeting God. One second. I've lived long enough to see so many people die in front of me, beloved, speaking to them one second, dead the next second, attended their funerals, did their funerals, and so we never know. So Paul says, motivation. Number two, notice the personal manifestation. He says in verse 11c, he says, and I trust also, he says, we're being, man, being manifest unto God. God sees us. And also are made manifest in your conscience. In other words, I want you to note the awareness Paul had of his own personal testimony before others. That word manifest, fenaruo, it means to be personally and visibly revealed himself to others as a faithful Christian. Paul says, you know what? I told you, if a person turns and they say, well, I'm going to drink still. God says, you can't get drunk, but I don't want you drinking in public. Why? Because we'll say Benny sees me drinking in public. Benny's been an alcoholic. Benny's wrestled with alcohol. So he sees Pastor Joel having a drink. And the next thing you know, Benny says, well, Pastor Joel can do it. I can do it. And then Benny does it, and he gets addicted back to alcohol. His liver starts sucking it up like a sponge, right? And now that alcohol is coursing and pumping through his body. And he's got to have more. And God says, Joel, I told you in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if that younger brother perishes, I'm going to hold you responsible. So you know what? If I'm going to drink, I'll drink privately. Right, Ellie? I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't drink. And I'm not going to say what I did. Okay? You know this is the joke. I don't drink anything stronger than pop, and he what? He drinks everything. Okay. The question is this, beloved. Are you mindful of your testimony before others, knowing that that guy next to you, your co-worker, your friend, your relative, they're one heartbeat away from meeting God? One heartbeat. And as much as you, imagine me saying to my wife, when I got saved, I, first thing I did was go to Ellie. It was easier to raise the dead. I mean, first thing I did, beloved, it, it really took three and a half years to get her saved. But I had such a burden for her. Imagine if she went to hell because I was afraid to talk to her. I was afraid to share the good news with her. Well, if there's good news, there's got to be bad news. The good news, you can be saved. What's the bad news? You're lost. The word gospel in the New Testament is the Greek word evangelion. The good news. You don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven. So what am I saying, dear beloved? I taught you the determined resolve. I taught you the day of reckoning. And whew, I taught you the discerning realization. The question is, on the day of judgment, will God find you faithful and obedient, or will he find you as an impenitent backslider or an unsaved person? Do you 
really know the terror of the Lord. Deep reverence and respect, but saying, you know what, I'm not going to go do that because I know that there's hell to pay if I do that. Why have I taught you this? Because I want you to know salvation. I want God to say to me in that day as your pastor, Pastor Joel, I gave you the grace, I gave you the wisdom, I gave you the knowledge, and you did it. You didn't care if people got mad at you, and I don't want people to get mad at me, beloved. But I would be mad at me if I let you go to hell. Not to mention what he would be. The terror of the Lord. Let's go to the throne of grace.